Thank you, Edgar, I think. Um, <laughs> I will just say it was funny that Edgar was talking a little bit, well, not funny, but he, he talked about shame because as I was sitting <laughs> over here, and this may set the tone for who I am as a person, so maybe this is a really good introduction of who I am, but as I was sitting there, I suddenly realised, oh, no, I'd planned a different outfit then realised that this thing, the, the battery weight... I didn't, it was just a dress, so it had nowhere to hook. And I thought, I can't wear that. So I changed, so I had a jacket that I could put the thing in. But then as I was sitting here this morning, a little voice reminded me that I had dark coloured undies on and a light coloured skirt. And I was like, oh no, I'm going to get up there and everyone's going to see my underwear. <laughs> and then God goes, well, at least they'll know you're wearing them. <laughs> so... I thought if I shared that with you, you'd realise that shame comes in lots of different ways and apologies if you can see my navy underwear today. Hadn't thought that through. Um, <laughs> anyway, now you're all looking. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. No. <laughs> anyway, at least I feel a little bit more comfortable now because I figure now you know and now you know how my brain works and that probably is a good introduction to the life of Burn. Um, yeah. My husband just yelled out, that's my wife. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I was first talking to Edgar about this, he made a suggestion, because today I'm actually going to be talking, well, the initial idea was just to talk about the gift of prophecy and talking about the prophetic. Um, God sort of took it on a slightly different, there you go, spiritual gifts, the basics. That's kind of where he sort of took it, because I realised I couldn't start teaching about the prophetic gift until we really knew about the basics of the understanding of all of the spiritual gifts, like how we get them, why we get them, what they're for, that sort of thing. So we're going right back to like spiritual gifts 101. This is the basic beginner's course. So first up, if you've got it and you know all of this, hopefully there's something here that doesn't bore you to tears, okay? If, if you're, you know, you're all over it, apologies. But when I was first talking to Edgar and he said, hey, why don't you get up and you can do like what the big prophets do and you could, you know, call someone out and give a word and I instantly went, no, that's just not my style. But I thought, it got me thinking that a lot of times that's the only way we've actually seen the gift of prophecy be used is when a prophet comes and they call someone out and they give a word of knowledge or they speak a prophetic word over their life. And while that's great, it has some shortcomings. One, if you're not a prophet, you don't have the chance to use that gift. And it says in the Bible that spiritual gifts are for all and they're freely given. So there's a problem with how you see that gift operating in that instance and how we're all supposed to use it. And the other thing is, often you're sitting there, you're desperately waiting to hear from God and you're not chosen. And so that can be a problem because you need to know that you can hear from others around you. So... Yeah, anyway, that was, that was what I was thinking about when Edgar said that. So I, I won't do that, if that's all right with you, sir. Uh, and, uh, sir, I'm trying to get brownie points. Uh, so maybe he doesn't ever ask me to do this again. Uh, and, and also, I was thinking um, of another story. Um, it, was, it was when I was doing my education degree, and we watched this wonderful video, and this guy was talking about his daughter, who obviously is a lot younger than he, that's how it works. And um, he was lamenting that no one wears watches anymore. Like before the invention of smartphones and garments and all other flashing, beeping things, just a normal wristwatch tells the time. He's like, no one just wears a watch anymore. And she said, the daughter said to the dad, oh, dad, it's a single function device. No one wears single function devices. And I was thinking about the gift of prophecy and all spiritual gifts and how we have this mindset that that's the way it works. Like it's just a single function. That's how the gift of prophecy works. That how is how helps works. That's how administration works. Whatever the gifts are. And God's actually going, well, actually, I made you a bit more like a, you know, a smartphone. You've got lots of apps and some will be activated at some time and some you have to log in and you have to use a password and you have to update. But there's lots to it and, there's, and none of us are the same. We're all different. So some of us have administration and some of us have prophecy. Some of us don't have those and we have others. Some of us have all of them which means you should probably be working a lot if you've got all those gifts, you should be using them. Um, so, yeah, so that was what I was thinking about, was how can I understand something that's such a broad topic and bring it down? And I was saying to Edgar, there was so much, and it just kept growing and growing. I'm like, what does God want to share today? So I thought I'd start at the very beginning. Oh, that sounds like a song. A very good place to start. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, oh, and apologies, because my Bible, I don't 
I don't think it's very trendy, but I've got a new King James version, so it's kind of got some old wordy language. So, I, this side seems very happy. <laughs> oh, there's one or two oldies over here too, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just, uh, this is, the, I've had this Bible, it was the first one I was given as a teenager, and um, it's still going strong. I love it. So, sorry if there's some oldie wordy language, but. So, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is where spiritual gifts start. You cannot have a spiritual gift and operate it from just one part of your body. God is calling us to be living sacrifices. A sacrifice means to kill, maim or destroy. That's a dictionary definition of it. And so what God's doing here is he's flipping that on his head. He's actually asking you to be a living sacrifice. He doesn't just want your heart. He doesn't just want your mind. He doesn't just want your imagination. He doesn't just want the work of your physical hands. He wants the whole thing, the whole thing sacrificed to him. If you just give your mind, God will use your mind but your heart will be overlooked. If you just give your heart, God will use your feelings, but your thinking and your rational thought will be overlooked. He wants everything to flow through everything, a living sacrifice. And then we're wholly acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. He's not even saying it's unreasonable. It's not even saying it's hard. He's going, this is just your reasonable service. This is just the basics of where it all starts. Completely, utterly, fully surrendered to him, a living sacrifice. And when I was talking to God about that and he gave me the image in Exodus, if we want to go to the next slide, Charlotte, Exodus 3, 1 to 2. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, The bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. That's what we're supposed to do. That's a living sacrifice. That bush was completely and utterly engulfed in flame. But if you saw a bush today completely and utterly engulfed in flame, it would be being destroyed. Its leaves would be being stripped. It would be turned to ash. But this bush was not consumed. The high school I went to actually has a logo of a bush on fire and the logo, like the Latin thing, is Arden said virens, which just proves that high school isn't for nothing. I do remember this. <laughs> it's not a lot of help, really, in real life. Like, you go for a bank loan, oh, Arden said virens, what do they get? No, Latin, it's not very helpful. But anyway, I do remember it because it means burning yet flourishing. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. And yet God loves to do things that aren't logical. He wants us to be completely and utterly consumed by him. There's none of us left. We're consumed. We're completely sacrificed. And yet we're flourishing. The bush was not destroyed. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. And what happened then is that Moses recognized he was on holy ground. In fact, the bush spoke to him. So I just want to challenge you and say, you know how we were talking before about, or we were singing before, I can't remember the exact lyrics, but it was basically along the idea that, you know, come down, Jesus, fill us up. We want to be a house of miracles. And what if we started right here? Instead of saying, God, come down to this house, this church, we actually started with, God, have my whole body. If each one of us came here today as a completely living sacrifice, absolutely fully aflame, every part of us completely just surrendered to him, totally walking in his plan, burning yet flourishing, you know, burning and not consuming, Consumed, absolutely, completely sacrificed to him on fire and we all came together. This could not help but be a house of miracles. If God can use a bush to talk through, what would he do through us with minds and brains and, and hearts and voices? What could he do when we were not only doing that ourselves, but we were doing that in unity? And I think that's what Pentecost is about. When they were in the upper room and they were all of one accord, they were all sacrificed. They were all holy bushes on fire. And then the Holy Spirit was just able to come in because the fire of God on you when you are fully surrendered makes you unable to fail. You know, it makes you unable to be consumed. It makes you unable to be destroyed. That's where you start with spiritual gifts. You start with surrendering everything. If we actually jump now to the spiritual gifts, and I 
moved my tabs out of order. So if you can go to the next slide. Oh, that's right. I wanted to do a little um, experiment. So can everyone just stand up? Come on, this is interactive. This is the teacher in me. Get to your feet. One, two, three. Eyes on me. <laughs> Good. No, hands down. Questions later. <laughs> you may not have a bathroom pass, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to ask, I want you to stay standing if you've ever attended a wedding, whether as a bride or a groom, bridesmaid, a guest at a wedding, or you've ever seen a wedding, just stay standing. All right? Sit down if you've not been to a wedding is what I'm saying. Okay, everyone. Now, I want you just to stay standing if at the wedding you heard these verses. Hence, the wedding verses. Particularly the bit from... Oh, I'll just read the whole thing. The wedding verses. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. He sit down if you haven't heard that done at a wedding. Yeah. These verses actually aren't about, like, love between a husband and a wife. <laughs> Although it's very nice to have them and they certainly can be applied that way. If we actually go back, we can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Now, it's a big chunk of scripture. I whacked it all together. I'm not going to be able to read that from here. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Pull it away. Can you hear me breathing too much? Sorry. I'm really getting heckled. <laughs> Sarah said to me before when she saw this, she's like, oh, um, I guess you're preaching today. And I went, yeah, yeah. No, actually, I just got this so that when I heckle like you, it'll be really loud and they'll hear me. <laughs> she quite liked that. But what I want to do is actually go back to the chapter before the love chapter, before the wedding chapter, and actually talk about the entire chapter, but we're going to condense it. So, first of all, I think Paul was pretty funny. He was throwing a bit of shade here at the Corinthians because he said in verse 1 of chapter 12, Now concerning spiritual gifts, gift, ugh, put your teeth in, Burn. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. He's basically saying because you are. You don't know what you don't know. And the church in Corinth were... Um, they're from a polytheist theistic culture. So they had lots of gods previously. And so when, when they've learned about Jesus and the truth of the gospel, they got really confused when the spiritual gifts started coming and the Holy Spirit started manifesting because they were thinking that if somebody had the gift of faith, well, that was the faith God. That was their thinking. You know, like they had gods of fertility and gods of, I don't know, harvest and stuff like that. So it was really hard for them to comprehend that the one spirit had all these gifts. It wasn't from different parts of different gods. It was one God and his spirit had all of these things. So he spends a lot of time here really making it clear. But what he does do is he talks about the differences of ministries. He talks about the different spirits. If we jump to verse 8, he says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. He's underlining it's the same spirit. It's not a different God, same spirit, same God. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same spirit. Working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues and interpretations of tongues. In verse 11, he says, But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So I put some things in bold there. But the manifestation of the spirit is giving to each one for the profit of all. I think I've missed that verse when I was reading it out. But so the purpose of the giving of the spiritual gifts is for the benefit of who? All. all. It's not for us. So if we have it, we're supposed to be using it for others. It's designed to be for other people. So for all. And the other thing I put in bold is it's distributed to each one individually as who wills. He, God, as he wills. So you can't do anything to earn it. You're not being punished if you don't have it. 
Right? And he'll give it to you, even if we talked before about the living sacrifices. If you haven't put anything on the altar, he'll still give you the gift. It just won't work in the fullness because only the part that's on the altar is the part that he will work through. God is a gentleman. He will not force himself on you. So if you haven't opened a door to that area of your life, he won't walk in it. If you want him to walk in it, you've got to lay it down and then he'll happily come on in. But he is a gentleman and he is kind and he will not force his way in. It's, it's the reason, what's the word? Not self-control. What's the word that he gives? Free will. He gives us free will and we can say no to him. I don't recommend that. <laughs> I recommend the living sacrifice, but you know he, he gives us free will so we can say no to him. And when we do, we shut him off from that part of our life. So going back to here, he gives them to us as he wills. They are gifts. What do you do when you get a gift? You unwrap it. And hopefully you use it. And if you know, Gary, if I gave you a bicycle, but I didn't give Donna one, whose responsibility would it be to look after the gift? Yours. Because it's your bicycle. <laughs> Put a motor in it and you can both use it. Well, you don't need a motorbike because I think you've already got one, right? Yeah, yeah. But the point is, whoever has the gift is the one that's responsible to look after it and to use it and to maintain it, not your spouse, not your neighbour, not your pastor. If you've got it, you should be using it and you should be looking after it. It's your gift. Okay. Um, where am I up to now? Oh, explaining that. Right. From verse 12, he then moves into the love chapter. So at the end of verse 12, if we look here, seven, what is it, 27 to 31. I really made that too small for my eyes. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles... Are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? I, I kind of feel like this is the impatient part of me. We get the point, but he labours on. Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, this is the bit I want to talk about. And yet I show you a more excellent way. He's saying earnestly desire them. You don't have all of them. We all, we all have different ones. We all need different ones. But I show you a more excellent way. And the more excellent way is chapter 13, the love chapter, the marriage chapter. He's actually talking about the greatest gift. No matter what gift God gives you, I can move on to the le next slide, please, Charlotte. Um, chapter 13 is kind of your manual of how you want to operate in your gift. I was talking to Edgar about the etiquette of prophetic ministry and the etiquette of you know when to speak when to hold your tongue how to say all those sort of things if you follow the love chapter you won't go wrong and literally you cannot go wrong though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal just take that as your promise of what will happen if you deliver your gift without putting on love what is a sounding brass? Have, imagine, well, I think there's a reason in the military they wake you up with like the Reveille. <laughs> it's not pleasant. <gasps> Shocks you awake. You know, it's sounding brass is loud, right? And a clanging cymbal hurts your ears. If someone came up and bang, not only would you get a big shock, but it would hurt your ears. Is that the way God designed you to use your spiritual gift? That you hurt somebody? That you cause pain? That you frighten them or that they... Shirk, that's not the way God designed you to use your spiritual gift. So you put love on so this doesn't happen. And then he goes through and talks about other gifts, the gift of prophecy, understanding all miracles and knowledge. But if I have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So I hurt people, I gain nothing, and I am nothing. I think it's a good idea to put on love. If we just jump forward, what's the verse I've got highlighted there? No, I want to go a bit higher. Oh, no, that's at the end. Right, okay. So, verse 8. Love never fails. 
I just want you to hang on to that in the context of your spiritual gifts because so often, okay, so you've, you've done the work, you've given everything to Jesus, you're completely sacrificed on the altar, your life is a testament to his goodness and glory, you are completely given to him, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, he is working through you, you are getting the gifts of the Spirit, you are working in them, you are, you are seeing God move but you're still frightened that you might get it wrong. If you are operating in any spiritual gift from the place of love, the scripture promises us that love never fails. You're afraid to give somebody that word of knowledge. You're afraid to give somebody that scripture you received. You're afraid that the vision God gave you might not be right. But if you're coming from a place of love, what does it tell us? Love never fails. This is like, it's like foolproof. You know, you're thrown overboard and you're going to jump back out of the ocean, back onto the boat. It's like you cannot fail. That should be exciting. That should be enough where we go, okay, well, maybe I will operate in my spiritual gift because if I'm coming from the true place of love, I've done all the work like that God's asked of me. I'm here holy before him. He's holy in me. I can't fail. That should be something that's exciting. That should remove fear from us. And then also, particularly, this is a little bit of the etiquette, I guess, around prophecy. Often we see a picture when we're praying for someone or we hear a word or we we get a song or we sense something. We then try to, instead of actually just sharing what we've seen, we try to understand it before we deliver it. Please don't do that. (laughs) Um, a good example of that, um, and I've shared often, um, I had a friend who went forward for prayer and she um, was told, the baby that you've longed for, the baby girl, is on her way. And my friend just about had kittens, not a baby girl. She, it freaked her out. One, her husband had had a vasectomy, so she was like, hmm, does this mean my marriage is on the rocks? Does it, you know, like, what is God... Because she believed the word, she was concerned by the word, she it was very upsetting for her. The second thing was she did have two sons. So she was thinking, am I not enough as a mother of two sons? Am I supposed to have a female? Like, what is God telling me I'm not enough? Also, she had no desire for a third child. Her second pregnancy was so completely traumatic. The doctors had actually said, no more for you. So all these things, she was like, I don't want a baby girl. Why would God tell me I'm pregnant with the baby girl? What's going on? When we were praying and talking about it later on and kind of trying to understand, she felt there was something there that was from God, but also it wasn't right. The lady that was praying for her had seen her pregnant and that's where she should have stopped with what she saw. If she had have said to my friend, I believe that you are pregnant, my friend would have gone, well, I know that's not possible. Why are you seeing me pregnant? And what was happening in her life at the time was God was actually birthing in her a new ministry. She and her husband were doing this whole new thing. And you know, whenever you start something new, it's needy. It takes a lot of your time. It starts little. It's painful. That sounds a lot like giving birth and growing a little human. You know, it's difficult. It's tiring. It's draining. They, you can't take your hands off them for a second. That was her new ministry. That was what God was trying to tell her. But this lady decided to put her own understanding over the top. And it caused a lot of pain. So whenever you're dealing with a prophetic, whether it be words of knowledge or you see a picture or you smell something, you hear a song, whatever way God is speaking to you to share to somebody else, just share what you see. Just listen and repeat. See and tell. Sense, feel, imagine, whatever it is that you're using, remembering that all of it's been placed on the altar. So you put your imagination there too. You put your thoughts there too. So God will use them. Whatever that's there and you are speaking into that person, just speak what you see. Don't think it through. Your job isn't to discern the word. That's the person who's receiving it. That's the way they participate with you. They receive or they don't. That's not your job. Your job is just to give. And often people will receive the word four or five times before they go, I really think God's talking to me. Your job isn't to make them believe. Your job is just to be the third or the fourth or the fifth time that they receive the word. You're just being obedient. Does that make sense? Oh, that's good. You're very quiet. I'm used to... I'm used to... Oh, well, no, I don't want you to heckle, but, you know, nice encouragement would be good, Stephen. 
I am used to um, working with seven and eight-year-olds when we do maths, and they don't shut up. So it's a little bit odd. You had, yeah, you had a question. <gasps> Yeah. And the fear of the fear of offering that we have. Yes. The fear that it might be wrong. Right. You just gave us an example of where it was kind of wrong. So how do you fit love never fails into that example? Well, I don't think she gave it out of love. To be really honest, in that particular oh, did you all hear the question? I'm thinking of people online. So I had said that love never fails and that you should be, you know, not afraid to step into your spiritual gifts. And then the question was raised, well, you just gave an, ex an example of where it failed. So uh, kind of did not prove my point. But I actually think that that word wasn't given from a place of love because if you love, you don't step into control. You don't step in to try and understand what's happening in that word. You just deliver. You are just a vessel. So God didn't fail. He saw what was happening in my friend's life and that Excuse me, that was the word for her season. But the person who delivered the word didn't... When you're stepping into control and when you're stepping into trying to understand and when you're stepping into trying to be the one that fixes solutions or has the answer, you're not working, walking in love because love is not self-seeking. Love does not seek to shame. Love does not seek to belittle. Love seeks to lift up. Love seeks to encourage and love seeks to say, I don't know that I understand this, but I'm going to give it to you because this next verse I'm going to talk about, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. We don't ever have the whole picture. We can't. We're not God. <laughs> and when someone comes to you for prayer, you don't know their background or their circumstances. Even though so many of you know me and so many of you know a lot of my story, there's a lot you don't know about me. And you could have a guess, but you don't know. But God does. God meets the gap. And if we're truly walking in love, when we're truly walking in the understanding of, I just know this little tiny bit right now, I don't have to be responsible for the whole thing. And I think the freedom in that... I'll give you an example of someone who did fail and God took care of it. Um, there was a preacher who was a big night of ministry, lots of prophetic words flying around. He was absolutely on fire. Got home and he was chatting with God about what a great night it was. And he was saying to God, basically, uh, in his words as he shares it, it, he wasn't very humble. He was like, that was a great night. Like, you couldn't have done that without me, God. <laughs> you know. And God had a chuckle and he, and he just said to, to this preacher... That was a really great word that you gave. And the preacher went, oh, that I gave? Wasn't that from you? And he's like, no, no, it wasn't, but I'll take care of it. And the preacher was like, oh, is he going to kill the lady that I gave the word to? Like, <laughs> is this a punishment for me? And, and God was like, no, no, it's okay, but I'll take care of it. It was good. I'll take care of it. Because the word was delivered in love. Now, I don't suggest that you just go making up stuff because you love someone and then preaching it, like, you know, putting it over them. But I would say that while we're in this um, learning how to use our gifts and we're walking, it's okay to get it wrong because God knows what our heart is. God loves the person that you're praying for more than you do. He's really got their heart and their life in his hands and he's way more concerned about them than you are, but you still have to love. Does, does that kind of answer the question? Or is it still a bit grey? You, you may carry on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I may carry on. <laughs> I may probably dig myself into another hole, but, you know, we'll work our way out together. And I think it's... I don't have all the answers. I, I mean, that's my interpretation of what happened, and I could be completely off. So... But I guess I just wanted to encourage you with the love never fails, that if you are loving somebody and you are completely sold out for Jesus and you're just letting him flow through you, then the chances of getting it wrong should be love never fails. Yeah. So is that encouraging? Yeah. I hope so. Oh. You're doing great. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay. Now, one thing I want to say, though, um, we did talk about um, the purpose of gifts and that they are for all the church. And I just wanted to share that there's also responsibility when you've received spiritual gifts that you keep yourself clean. Um, I think the best way that I can kind of describe it is like um, we talked about having a bicycle and you keep it clean. If you don't keep the pies, pies pumped up, tires pumped up, and you don't and you don't keep um, I don't know maintaining it. I, I, I don't use a bike, so I'm assuming there's some cha okay chain lube. There you go. 
Thank you, heckler. That was nice, positive heckling. Uh, you know, the things you need to do to keep it maintained, you're not going to go very far. You know, you have flat tyres, you blow a tyre, the chain will come off, whatever it is, it's not going to work. So it needs a little bit of work. With spiritual gifts, the work isn't really work, it's actually cleanliness. If you think about it, and this is where I really liked that Edgar was talking about shame today, because I remember when... Um, it was quite, like before we had all this lovely rain, and the backyard and the front yard is quite um, dusty and dirty. So you've got to mow the lawn, because you know you get the long bits, but then you've got like patches of dirt. And so to get to the long bits, you've got to go over the patches of dirt. And of course, you come in after you've mowed the lawn, and you look like you've got a tan, because you, you, know, you take your socks off, and this is just all brown and dirty. Do you come in and go, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I'm dirty. How did I get dirty? This is horrendous and beat yourself up about it. No, you just jump in the shower and wash it off. Like, you don't, it's just what happens when you're out doing what you need to do. You just get dirty. I don't go lie in my bed when I'm dirty. I don't go, you know, walk on the carpet or, or rub against my couch or something. I just go jump in the shower and wash it off. So, why do we get upset when we stuff up? Why do we walk in shame? Why don't we just go and get clean? When I go to the optometrist, I'm always really embarrassed when I have to give Shannon my glasses <laughs> because even if I've wiped them in the car quickly before I've gone in, they're going to be gross. You know, they're on my face every day. I literally can't see without them. And when I give them to Shannon, she never says, oh my gosh, Benedict, you are a filthy pig. <laughs> And she probably, I mean, I don't want to look at them now because I'll be grossed out. But, you know, like just the skin and the makeup and the sweat and the hairspray and the just fingerprints or, you know, you go like that to move your hair out of your face and you've got a great big fingerprint right over there. Just those kind of things. General wear and tear, they get grimy. Grimy, I like that word, grimy. But Shannon never belittles me. When I go back to the person who gave me my lenses in the first place, she never shames me. And we should be doing the same. We should be going back to Jesus and going, I got my hands dirty. And he'll go, that's okay, let's clean you up. Let's get you clean again. Let's just wipe your lenses clean. Then you can go out and you'll see clearly. Because the problem with the dirt is it obscures your view. So you're not seeing clearly. You're not seeing prophetically clearly. You're not seeing in your workplace clearly, in your home life, in the school setting, wherever you're at, you can't see if your glasses are messed up. I need my glasses to function, but I need to keep them clean so that they help me. You know, so it's a constant coming back to the, like, going back to the glasses analogy, going back to the optometrist, getting cleaned, getting checked up and being sent out again. Come back to Jesus, get clean, come back out again, nice and clean, without shame. Amen. Good, yeah. Yay! I got a clap too, woohoo! Yeah, so don't, don't be ashamed. I really like when we do prayer ministry um, and Helen would dust us off afterwards. Like, it was no big deal. There was no shame. It was like she would literally dust it. Okay, let's just get that off. When you're praying for someone and you're kind of taking on their burdens and you're praying and you're really... No, don't take it. Dust it off. Get clean again. Just like going to the optometrist and getting <laughs> your lenses clean. It's, I like that. It was never... I guess it was modelled to me that it wasn't a big deal. And if you're not getting dirty, <laughs> it's because you're not doing any work. Because the world is a messy place. So if you stay in the house, in the church, you'll be pristine. You'll be right with the Father all the time. But you're not much good here. What's the expression of so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good? Yeah. We're meant to go out. We're all kings and priests. and we all. Edgar is our pastor, right? But he can't go where I go. He doesn't live in my street. He doesn't know my neighbours. His kids didn't go to my school, where my girls go. So he can't preach there. He might be the preacher and the teacher, but we're supposed to take what we're receiving from him into our ministry places, into our workplaces. That's one of the spiritual gifts, the gift of evangelism. How many people feel they don't have that? We all should have it because we're all placed uniquely to be that burning bush so that when people come and see us, they take off their shoes because they realise the presence of Jesus is on us and they're in holy ground because the Jesus that Edgar has taught us about is in us and we've taken him with us and we're on fire and they're like, that's really different. I want to be like that. We go to places others can't go. I can't go into the school where my kids go. They are literally little missionaries <laughs> sent into spy lands. You guys are the same. You go places I can't go. Take Jesus with you when you're on fire. That's the gift of evangelism. 
Anyway, I think I got a bit sidetracked there, sorry. No. <laughs> um, thank you. So, I just wanted to spend a bit of time now, actually... Oh, can, is there another slide, Shah? Oh, there you go. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. We're taught to desire spiritual gifts. We're, it's okay to want them. So, don't feel bad if you haven't got them. You can still want them because it tells you to desire them. Especially that you may prophesy. Well, that is a personal favourite of mine. For he who speaks in a tongue does... Oh, I'm going to skip over that because it gets a bit confusing about which one's greater and what have you. But they're all wonderful and they're all gifts. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. What does it mean to edify? Yeah, lift up. What does it mean to exhort? Encourage, yeah. And comfort... Obviously, we kind of know what comfort means. So they're big words, but basically lift up, encourage and comfort. That's the, I guess, purpose of the spiritual gift of prophecy. And he who prophesies edifies the church. Again, it's not for you. What Helen has is for you. What you have is for you. What you have is for you. What you have is for you. I think you're kind of getting the point. It's not meant to be for ourselves. And one of the things actually that I learned very early on from Helen, when I started to walk in this spiritual gift and I was like, I can see so clearly on everyone else. And when I turn it in on my own family, absolutely blind. Cannot see a thing. Like I don't have any spiritual gift. I don't know Jesus. It's a complete blockage. Blind. Worse than not having my glasses on. Absolutely, completely blind. And Helen was like, well, duh, you're, you're designed to be in family. You're designed to be in community. You need something that somebody else can come and give you. We're designed to be in unity together. We're designed to work together. It's part of being the body of Christ. So even though you might come forward and God will speak and give you amazing spiritual word through someone who's on the prayer line they might then need the same thing from you for their own family. It's part of being connected. Even though you might have all the spiritual gifts, you'll have blind spots because God wants you to have blind spots so somebody else can lift up. And also the thing about spiritual gifts is the more you have and the more you give away, the better it is. You know, like if I get a jar of lollies, I'm not really keen to share them with my kids. I'm kind of hiding them away because I'm a bit of a lolly belly. And I know that at the end of the jar of lollies, they're gone. But with spiritual gifts, the more I give away, someone else steps up, I get to benefit from that. They can take my place. I'm very happy for them to stand on my shoulders and go further than I've ever reached, particularly like our young people. I'm, I'm totally cool with that. I'm, the purpose of my role in Living Grace is that my kids totally replace me. You know, that the next generation, that I, that I come to them and they feed me. It's, I don't have to be frightened that someone's going to be better than me. I actually should be excited if someone's better than me because that benefits me. Talking about it completely selfishly, the better you guys are as a younger generation lifting up the church, the better we are because our grandkids get to sit at your feet and so on and so forth. And the community comes in and benefits from me. If it stops with me, it stops with as, as far as I can go. And I know my own limitations. I'm not God. You know, there's a limit to how far I can understand and go and, and, and speak and, and see. But he can go further. So I just wanted to take a time where we actually went back to the living sacrifice. Actually, sorry, I do... There's some more verses God gave me. I nearly forgot about them, Sorry. Another thing in regards to the gift of prophecy... Oh, is there another slide for this one, Charlotte? Yeah. Talking about our lenses and keeping clean, there's just these verses. So Proverbs 27, 19. As in water, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. When you're giving a spiritual word, be aware that you can taint it if that makes sense. Your heart... How can I explain this in a way that makes sense? Um, if, for example, you had a past hurt, um, 
being really cautious because I don't want anybody's hurt to be the one that I talk about. Um, but if you had a past hurt and you meant that you felt, okay, all right, I'll go with that one. Um, you were hurt by someone in authority, whether it was a teacher, a parent, um, a pastor, but someone in authority over you who held power over you hurt you. When you are walking in your Christian life, you've given everything to God, but you haven't realised that this hurt is actually shaping your heart and you're still holding bitterness to that person, you could really struggle with giving a word if it's something about submitting to authority because it's wrestling with a hurt that you haven't laid down. It's like you've heard correctly, but it doesn't sit well within you because your heart is, is like just wrestling with that. D does that make sense? Yeah, so it's like you have a leaning towards the other way. Now, God's really clever. He factors this in. He knows that, um, oh, that's a good story. I remember being at Latoya's house. Oh, I hit the microphone. Uh, Latoya has no idea I'm going to share this story. Um, and there was a, a bottle, a really pretty bottle on the table of water, and someone poured a glass of water, and they went, oh, my gosh, this water tastes weird. And Latoya went, oh, um... That was an old scotch bottle that we washed out. Do you remember this story? Yeah. That was an old scotch. Oh, that was a really pretty bottle, so I thought I'd reuse it, but clearly we haven't washed it out enough because it tainted the water. So what the, what literally the spirit that was in that bottle tainted the glass of water. And they were like, Yeah, I'm not sure I want to drink that water. It was like <laughs> not what I came here for. So God can actually factor that in. So he will give you the word that he wants someone to hear if he wants it to have that twist. Okay, he's really clever like that. But also, if you have anything in your heart that is, you know, an issue, that's also going to block you from being able to get those words. So I really encourage you to spend some time checking with God that your heart is okay. And Jesus actually said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart... His mouth speaks. What's coming out of your mouth has a direct link to your heart. Now, when we're dealing in the prophetic and we're hearing from God, our job is literally to listen and repeat. But it does filter through us. We are the scotch bottle that has been tainted. What is poured out of us, that flavour is going to come out. So we need to make sure that our hearts are okay. We need to make sure that what's coming in is what's going out. Okay, and the next scripture, Miss Charlotte, thank you. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, the my brethren, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. That's from James 3, 10 to 12. I want to share a story with you that was really, really, it changed, I think, the course of my personal ministry. I was walking in here. That was when that was the prayer room, before it became the, the corporate box. Um, and, <laughs> sorry, did you not know it was called that? No. <laughs> That's where all the professional Christians sit, in the corporate box. <laughs> Just, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Pressure's on you guys. <laughs> and I was walking through to prayer one morning and I, something had happened in our lives where a family member had really let my husband down. I have to be really careful what I say because obviously a family member is a family member. Um, and I was so angry for Nathan that he'd been let down yet again by this person. Like promises were made and he was just very faithful off he went. But I just, I was so angry. And as I was walking in here, my anger and frustration and my hurt for my husband was just building up inside of me. And I went to open up my mouth and I heard God, and it stopped me in my tracks. Stop. If you give this word, this is what I felt God say to me, if you give this word, you cannot give any more good words. I, I mean, I was literally about to call down the fire of God on them. Like it was a full on curse. I was so hurt and so mad. And I just was, without going into specifics, it was genuinely warranted. It was like, I felt like it was a holy, righteous anger. But God said, if you deliver this word, you cannot deliver any good words in future. And I was like, oh, I don't know that that's what I want to do. 
And this scripture came to mind. Out of your mouth cannot have salt water and fresh water. Are you going to pickle and preserve and brine? Or are you going to give fresh water and bring fresh life and fresh growth? And I was like, I don't want to pickle and preserve and brine. I don't want to be salt water. I want to give fresh life. I want to lift people up. I don't want to shrink them down. And I didn't know what to do. But the Bible verse, James 4, 7, which was given to me when I was in... Seven in a kids' church Sunday school, and it was submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I think, is it also a Colin Buchanan? Yeah, as well. Yeah, Colin Buchanan. So that came back to me. So I was like, okay, I trust God that I've heard from you. That's okay. I don't have a trust issue around this. I, I can easily submit to you. But the part that was really hard for me was actually resisting the devil. So I could submit that what God was saying was correct. But resisting the devil in this instance, God was asking me to actually bless the people that two seconds ago I wanted to call down the fire of God and absolutely, completely destroy. That was really hard. It didn't come naturally and I still had a lot of hurt. And I'll be honest, I didn't really feel like doing it, but I did it anyway. And I don't think I've ever... Actually, I can honestly say I've never felt the need to curse anybody before, uh, since... Since that time, he really did flee. That for me was solved in that minute. But I tell you what, it was just so serious. I don't think I've ever heard God that loud and that forceful to me before. I, I mean, he said lots of things to me before where, which have brought me to tears and brought me to my knees and, and he humbled me. But that made me stop in my tracks. Like the, it was almost the audible voice of God. Like nobody else heard it. But to me, it was as if God grabbed me and just went, Stop! This is going to alter the pathway of your ministry. He really made it very important to me. So I want to make the same importance to you today. Be cautious with what comes out of your mouth. What's the expression? Little tongues sink big ships. Is that in the Bible or is that just a... Oh, thank you. Edgar says yes. <laughs> little tongues. Little tongues? Little words? No, tongues are like the Bible. Oh, tongues are like... The, oh, so I didn't quite have it right, but I was on the right path. Little, to, little tongues? Tongues are like the rudder. Little. Anyone got it? No, no, I mean actually got the scripture. Oh, it's in James as well? <laughs> it's the whole chapter that we were in in James 3, yeah, called the untamable tongue. I actually have it highlighted. Oh, that's, oh, little tongues sinking big ships isn't. Oh, it was British wartime. Wow, I really am learning something. Okay, well... Loose lips sink ships. Is, that's not in the Bible. All right. Can I have the Bible one? All right. Everybody, eyes on me. He's looking this way. Let's come back down. Thank you for your input. Mrs. Tranter loves that you communicate. Okay. If we go back to the untamable tum, tongue in chapter three, here we go. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. And then it comes on to here. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Okay. I did look. I'm going to go and research that. I'm actually quite interested in wartime loose lips sink ships. Not relevant today. Yes, please. The Bible verse for the small rudder. Yep. Okay, can you give me that reference again? Because so that was James three two, I guess. Ah, thank you. Up further, James 3.3, 3. indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Yep. I like the expression, again, not in the Bible, but I like analogies. Big doors open on small hinges. Yeah. So we can, we, 
and I think that works, <laughs> that works positively and negatively. Saying something in season that's beautiful can open up something magnificent. Saying something hurtful can actually maybe shut doors of blessing or open things up to the enemy. Yeah, so we need to be cautious with our tongues. <sighs> Me too. Me too. So James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I guess the best example of resisting the devil is doing the opposite of what you feel tempted to do. So in that case, I wanted to curse, so I did the opposite, which was bless. So we've talked about um, the foundation of the spiritual gifts in that you need to be completely surrendered. And I wanted to just to take a moment to go back there. Before we release any spiritual gifts, I want to take a moment to make sure that your hearts are right. I know a lot of people struggle with um, thoughts, like understanding, comprehension, the, I guess the intelligence, you know, you, your mind. Um, so they're willing to give how they feel or they think because they kind of... Uh, sorry, they're willing to give how they feel and their emotions because they kind of see God as being touchy-feely. But he's also incredibly intelligent and he wants your mind. And vice versa, other people are like, I, I have faith, I believe God, he's got my mind, but there is no way I'm crying in church. I am completely shut off to feeling anything. I don't want to feel the Holy Spirit. I don't want to feel him you know, move in me. And so they, they, they cut that off. If you give God everything, he can use everything. I mean, there were times in prayer where we can smell Jesus and we can smell the opposite. It's not great. We can see what Jesus is doing. We can taste honey or, or you know, we can taste him. His sen your senses touch, taste, uh, hearing, sight. Anyway, all of them. If you give them over, he'll use them too. Your imagination. How often, because kids haven't been taught what they can and can't imagine, and they'll be like, Mummy, there's a monster under the bed. What if there actually is? And you've said, it's just your imagination. What if there's actually a demon under their bed? And you've desensitised yourself to even feeling that, but the kids haven't. And then we teach them, even as kids, don't be afraid, there's no boogeyman in the closet. I'm telling you, you know, what we bring into our homes, what, how, what we walk in, you get dirty and you track at home. The kids know to look and they, they haven't been taught, don't use that part of your imagination. Like, you don't, you, you don't imagine when it comes to God. You don't think. It's got to be God's thoughts. One thing I will say about when we release prophetic gifts, if you're in a race... <laughs> Let's go 100 metre race. And there's, when he was at his peak, who was that really fast Jamaican runner? Usain Bolt. Oh, wasn't he great to watch? He just, he looked like he was floating. You know, he was the best in the world. And then as he crosses the finish line, he's like, hey. You know, like he didn't even make it look like it was hard. So he's running, running the race. And lining up in lane two is me. Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> I'll get to the end several days later. <laughs> That's how fast he is. In line three, we've got God. Oh, you weren't expecting that, were you? No. So we've got the fastest man in the world. No one can beat him at, when he was at his peak. Then we've got me, little old, just put picture, this is you, every day here. And then we've got God. Who's going to get to the end first? Not me. Not me. I'm not going to get to the end of the race first. Usain's going to get there second. But why will God win? Because he's everywhere at once and he's already at the end. It was a trick question. And so it's the same. When you get a spiritual word, when you sense something, feel something, see something, and you're so worried that it's you, yeah, you're so silly. God's already there. He was there before the word was delivered. He knew what it was going to be. Before the person came forward to be prayed for, he already knew what they needed and he already had it to give to you. And then you're worried that you're the one that somehow is going to outrun God? Are you serious? <laughs> you can't. It's impossible. But I will tell you who else is in the race. Yeah. And he's going to come in straight away with doubt. That's what he's going to throw at you. And he's going to tell you, look, 
Look at Helen, who's been praying for years. She's like the Usain Bolt now analogy. Look what she can do. She can pray for people and they get slain in the spirit. She can cast off demons. She can set people free. You can't compete with that. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't deserve to be in the race. You don't have the answer. Uh, Newsflash, he doesn't win either. God is already at the finish line. He already has the answer. He's already given you the word. Take it and trust in faith that you have seen, you have heard, you have smelt, you have experienced God directly with your whole body that's whole on fire. Don't let doubt, don't let someone who doesn't deserve even to be in the race rob you of what God's trying to do through you for someone else. It's just not right. You need to back yourself Because God is the one that's feeding you and he's already won. He's given you the gold medal. Before the race has started, he's already won it. It's so hard for us to get our head around, but it is true. So going back to living sacrifice, I just want to um, take a moment. If you feel that there's a part of you, any part, that you haven't fully surrendered and put on the altar, I want you just to stand. Don't feel ashamed. Should we all stand so that you don't feel you know, um, targeted. Any part of you. Um, and, you know, it might be, you might be a jumper. You jump up on the altar in church and you jump back down as soon as you get into your workplace. You're like, not a jumper as in a jumper that you put over your body, Carly. I saw you. It was a silent hecker, heckle. She's like, jumper. No, I mean, someone that jumps up on the altar willingly, they get there, but as soon as they're in like a hard place, whether it's work or home or even as soon as they get out to the car, they're like, I'm jumping back down off the altar and I can't give it to him. You need to be consumed. I pray for you that you would have stickability, that you would get on the altar and that you would have a real tangible revelation of the fire of God on you that makes you want to stay there, fully alight, and that you would take him with you as you go. The concept of being sacrificed, I think, and surrendering is scary. Like I said before, when you sacrifice something, you kill, maim or destroy. But in killing yourself, in sacrificing yourself, in destroying yourself, laying down everything of you and putting it on the altar, the irony of that is, is that then you truly live. Then you truly are flourishing. You are burning and you are not consumed. You are absolutely and completely living for him in a way that you can't if you just give part. He wants the whole. Lord Jesus... I just ask that you would show us what areas of our lives that we have held back from placing on the altar. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to climb up onto the altar. I'm actually seeing people that are literally feeling like I'm too old, I'm too decrepit, I can't climb up. I just want to say that that is a lie. And regardless of your age or your experience or your length of time walking with Jesus, whether you're new to his family or whether you've been with him a long time, you can keep doors of your heart close to him. So I just encourage you that you would willingly just say a little prayer, I give you all those doors. I open up all of those doors. Just take a moment to whisper it to Jesus now. Every part of, bless you, Charlotte, every part I open up, every part I release, every part I just lay on the altar for you, God, all of it. And Father God, now as we are on your altar, I ask for the fire. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would set us aflame, that there is not a single part of us that is separate from you, but that we are utterly and completely in the fullness of on fire for you. 
that we are burning, we're not consumed. We are flourishing and we are growing. Now, in regards to spiritual gifts, I just release in the name of Jesus every spiritual gift that you desire. I want you to imagine that there's an angel in front of you with a beautiful tray and there are beautiful boxes and they are spiritual gifts. And one of the things we often do in prophetic ministry is we ask you to do a physical action that represents a spiritual truth. So as you're standing there, I want you to grab, I want you to reach out and I want you to pull them in. Everyone's doing it and they've got their eyes shut so you don't have to worry about feeling like a wally. Just grab, grab them and pull them in. Just say, I receive. I just receive them. Thank you, Lord. And I ask that you would start to show, even now, visions. May we smell you. May we see you. May we hear you. May we sense you. I just ask that you would awaken those things, in those, particularly those places that we have kept locked away, that we have kept hidden that we have kept from you previously. I ask that you would flood them right now, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I wasn't quite sure how we would proceed in this next bit. I had lots of different ideas, but I feel that God's given me the way that he'd like us to go. So um, you can be seated for a moment. But I am going to ask, is there um, a couple of people, maybe three people, who really are seeking to hear from God, who would love to receive a word of prophecy or a vision? Jan, you put your hand up pretty quickly. Yep, you can stay where you are. You don't have to come up. Is there anybody else that would like to receive? Yeah, I'm sorry, I forget your name. Malena? Malena. Malayla. Sorry, my apologies. And what was your name? Ryan and Ryan. So just, you don't have to know their names. I just thought it was nice if we all did. Hi, I'm Bernie. Um, So we just take a moment now um, and just, I want you to seek God for these three people. Um, You can shut your eyes. You don't have to, um, I guess, be worried about what anybody's saying. I want you to listen to what God is saying. I also just want to remind you that it's, um, it's okay to be unique. So when my husband first started seeing in the spirit, he would actually get scripture verses and because he's a mad sportsman, he would actually see them as if it was a scoreboard at the footy. That's how God would flash it up to him. So God will speak to you in your unique weirdness too and that's okay. So you may not get a scoreboard flashing up like Nathan did. I just thought that was so cool because it was so him. You know, it was really, God was obviously speaking to him, but it was just in his special way. So you, you, you will hear things in your special way. It's okay to be unique. So just take a moment. It could be a word. It could be a picture. And it could be for Jan, Malayla or Ryan. Father God, I just ask that you would speak to us in, the, in this moment, that we would hear your voice. Give us the courage knowing that love never fails, that we can give the words that you have for these people. Okay. Does anybody feel like they're seeing anything? Will we start with Jan? Does anybody have anything they wanted to share about Jan? Maybe somebody who hasn't had a word before, although I know you have the prophetic gift, so you're spot on. I do definitely want to hear what you have to say. But anybody who maybe hasn't felt like they've walked in this before? Oh, you're all old hats. Do we have a microphone that I can use, Bredo? Sorry. Just mindful that people at online won't hear. Hello? Oh, I better not. Can I go walkie walkie? You had a word? Did you have a, you didn't have a word? No? Who I know you had a word. I know you I have been blessed by your prophetic word, so I'm, I'm dying to hear this. Oh, for, for, okay. for you, Jan. 
Jan, I just, all I saw was the word praise. And it was similar like the billboard, but it wasn't a billboard, but it was the word praise. And I'm not even going to try and interpret it because I'm not supposed to. <laughs> Thank you. Did anybody else receive anything for Jan? Oh, for Ryan. Oh, you did for, okay. I'll come back for you for Ryan. Did anybody um, experience something in a way that maybe they haven't before, like a, a fragrance? Or a taste? But do they think of a song or a food? I'm really testing you here. Oh, is that a hand? This is fun. I feel like I'm on, I don't know, a, a talk show. I received for Malayla. Oh, okay. Well, let's go with that. Go with, go with what you received for Malayla. Uh, her with a, a beautiful best cake that she'd ever made, taking her oh. to a friend. And I know she does this, but it just came, came to into you. my head yeah. whether that was just a thought or whether... Now, I that sounds like doubt. Yeah. No. yeah. No, and I think you're on the... No, don't apologise. I think you're on the money. <laughs> and, oh, is that, a, is that not a godly expression to say you're on the money? Sorry. My bad. No, I... Don't, sorry, just a little bit of encouragement. Go with that first thought. If that's what you got, that's from God. Remember, he's already at the finish line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who had one for Ryan? Yeah. Yes. Oh, you did too. Oh, it's raining. Oh, yes. Hello, Ryan. I just saw you hi, um, on a treadmill, and you're, you're travelling really fast on the treadmill. That's all I'm going to say. Good. There you go. That's something for you to think about, Ryan. Oh, everyone's got their hand up. Okay. Oh, mate, you're popular. Yeah, for Ryan, uh, good name. My uh, one of my sons is called Ryan. But uh, for you, I saw a stage. No idea what it means. Good. Helen's confirming that one. Oh, I got back there. Was it you, Ellen, that you had your hand up here? Oh, and also Christine. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan. I just heard the words "fire falls on sacrifice." It. You can watch this back later on. I was about to say you should write this down, and I was like. You had your hand up too, Christine. Yeah, I know this is really weird. I just got the word tractor. Oh, I love weird ones. Oh, it's raining words over here. Okay. The, hey, you guys over there need to lift your game up. Oh, okay. All right. All right I'll come back over. Malayla, that's all right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. For Malayla. Yeah, I got one for Malayla. Malayla, I saw you bubbling up. I got the word mm. bubble. But you know how in um, some people make artworks uh, out of adding dye to soap bubbles and when the bubbles break, they leave this beautiful design away, around, um, underneath. And I got that as you bubble out on other people, you leave a beautiful mark Residue. behind. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I like that one too. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you have a word? Yeah. yeah. Who was your word for? Uh, um, for Ryan. For Ryan? It's just one word. It was just evangelist. Evangelist. Oh, Penny. Yeah, it was for Ryan as well. I just got the word, um, you are enough. Oh, that's nice. Oh, now it's raining in the middle section. All right. Graham. This is for Ryan as well. I, I just saw a picture, a picture of a, a, a road. You've been on a winding road where you've really had to concentrate on every bend on the road. But you're coming out of that winding road onto a long straight road now where you can focus on what you're meant to do. Oh, I like, I like Graham's words. Oh, you've got one too, Sid? Yeah, I have one for Malala. Malala? And it, was, it was in English, it wasn't in Spanish, but he said, you are my beloved. Aww. Oh, oh, Sid, I like that word. Um, oh, hang on, I think it turned off. Did I turn it off when I handed it to you somehow? No? Oh, it's good? Yeah. Okay. Malayla, I had for you, um, I was looking at you and you were leaning up against this big tree and then I realised it was an apple tree and it was these bright red apples. And then as you were resting under this tree, um, there were all these wicker baskets filled with these apples all around you and you were just kind of resting there peaceful and then all these rainbow coloured butterflies mm. were just flying around your head. So that's a really detailed word. That had a lot in it. Uh, I will come back. Sorry. Um, Ryan, <laughs> um, you've been getting a lot of words today. 
that the Lord really wants to tell you he's got his eyes on you. And Bernie t talked about the soccer board and what I saw for you was sports orientated too and it was the Olympic stand where you stand to get the medal. But this one has got many steps. Keep going. There's a great call on your life for ministry. Mm. You've got a heart within you that the, the Lord just wants to smash open with his love. There's love there, but he wants to explode it with more. And Graham, <laughs> it's really close. That road is opening up. It, he just wants you to persevere. And today was a special encouragement for you mm. not to slacken off. And not to let those words that Bernie's been talking about, those dark words, overtake you. But remember the podium. It's not just three ramps. It's quite a few. But just keep going. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, Thank you, Nana Helen. Uh, oh, Nana, hi. Um, I, I just quickly got a word immediately, and I'm not sure I asked God who it was for, but I'm not sure, but it's, it's from Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, plans for a future and a, a hope and a future. I might take that word for myself too. Um, yep. That's for Jan. Jan, they just said that was for you. Okay, you got it, you got it. Charlotte, you had a word, honey buns. Oh, no, no, you need the mic. Sorry. I got this one for Malayla. Malayla? Malayla. Um, and it was the French word, j'adore, which means, like, I love you or I adore you. Oh. There you go. Amy? This is fun. I like this. Does anyone else like this? I, I got a song for Jan, which I thought was nice. funny because I know that you're a musical person. But the song was Ain't No Mountain High Enough, Ain't No River Wide Enough. So... <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's oh, the song that's cool. into mind when I started praying for Jen. Oh, that's, I love when things like that happen. I just yeah. say I made that one because I'm like, we joke about mum being a smother. <laughs> I was like, ain't no mountain high enough to keep her from me. <laughs> oh, Jen, maybe take it in a different way than your daughter gave it to you. Um, but also, I love, wasn't it funny, though, that you happened to wear... This is, I love the prophetic and how it's sometimes a little bit weird, but you happened to wear the exact same outfit that two of the worship team we were joking about was the new uniform, and you got the song word. Uh, see, he was already at the finish line. He told you what to wear, and you didn't even know. <laughs> Does anybody else want... Oh, yeah, Sharon? I just got two. One for Jan is beauty. Mm. And Malayla, I just got that. You've got the spirit of discernment and that love, joy, peace, all that goes with it too. Nice. Oh, more. Yeah. Oh, our worship leader. Yeah, I'll just share. As, oh, well, we're gone. Are, Are we there? Yeah. I'm a bit like, um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's, it was for one of the women. Um, I got a picture of a watering can, but it was see-through, and then it went and watered this beautiful indoor tropical plant that was wilted and had been given up on, and then it just immediately sprung to life. <laughs> so it was a really big plant, one of those tropical ones that I can't keep alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another one? Are we almost done or are you still pushing in? Edgar said yes. We're almost done. I think I'm getting the wind up. Um, concerning the four horsemen, right? Famine, pestilence, disease. Who's your word for? Oh, oh, it's just general information. Oh, how about we chat after? Right. So that we can keep going with the words. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah. all right, let's do that. Does anyone else have a word? You've got a word? Was that a putting your hand up? Oh, you drew a picture. Oh, well, this is really using your... Who... Oh, can you... Hang on, can you describe it to me? She's actually painted something or drawn something. So, but obviously that's not going to translate well across everybody because it's about A5 size. So could you share, tell us what you've um, drawn? Basically it's a few rocks and out of each of the rocks, not just one, 
um, is there's water. Um, it's like Moses in the desert where he split the rock. Mm. But it's several rocks. It's more than one. Um, and it's creating a, um, a, not a... Not even just a river but a pool mm. of water around all of these rocks. Um, that's it. <laughs> nice. Um, well, Malayla, Jan and Ryan, maybe go and have a look at that afterwards and see if that is for you. Take a picture on your phone or something. I think that's a really good example too of how God uses your gifts, every part of you. So obviously you have an artistic gift and you're able to actually draw what you see. I really don't have that. So I describe what I see because I am a bit of a chatterbox, as you can tell, because I'm still talking. Um, Edgar, is there anything else that you need to do? Okay. Um, <laughs> Edgar said, I can bless you and we can go. Yes, miss. So I think he was going. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes, All right. Oh, did you hear that? You've had it for ages, it's my turn now. <laughs> that was the first heckle. That was the... <laughs> And it still was a kind one for me. It was kind of still heckling you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Nice to know you're in. Nice to know you only heckle Edgar, not me. Um, so, I encourage you to take some time, perhaps in your small group or in a safe group of of um, friends that you can practice in, to actually start playing around with those spiritual gifts. We a lot of people were very brave today to share what they saw, and it was kind of drip fed and then it exploded a little bit. So I want you to be encouraged to give it a go and not be afraid because love never fails. And if you have put everything on that altar, you're burning, you're flourishing, he's flowing through you, it can't help but be him that comes out. I will say that those of you that receive words today, what Jesus' mother did when she received words, the scripture tells us, is she took the words and the prophecies about Jesus and she stored them in her heart. You take what you believe is for you and you store it in your heart and you steward that gift. You think about it, you ponder on it. They're yours. If it doesn't fit or it doesn't align with you, you don't take it and you don't receive it. It's your choice. We've been obedient in offering them to you, so it's up to you what you do with them. Um, I don't know how to do a blessing. What do you, is there something special I have to do? Oh, thank you, Edgar. I received that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't resist. It's not often you get a one-on-one -on -one blessing in front of everyone. Okay, sorry. Now that, now that I've received it, I can pass it on. <laughs> I bless you in the name of Jesus. Have a great week.